Himmlischer Vater, wir kommen noch einmal vor dein Angesicht. Dear Heavenly Father, again we want to approach your throne. Wir bitten dich herzlich für ein offenes Herz. We ask that you may open our hearts and our minds. Dass wir die Botschaft verstehen. That we may be able to grasp the message. Und dass sie auch in unserem Herzen bleibt. And that it will also remain in our heart. Schenke auch offene Herzen für unsere Geschwister zu Hause. Please also open the hearts of our brethren and sisters at home. Und segne uns jetzt mit deinem Heiligen Geist. Amen. And please give us the blessing of your Holy Spirit now. Amen. Um, to add to the record, we've had a discussion here um, about whether we should stop the second woe, the sixth trumpet in 1840 or 1844. Um, Haskell pioneers were stopping it in 1840. Uh, that's, a, that's a given. Um, their reasoning was um, in Revelation 11, Uh, verse 14, it says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. So what they were saying is, The second woe is past, behold, the third woe cometh quickly, is implying some break of time. There had to be a space between the second and the third woe for John to emphasize that It was coming quickly. But I think anyone that reads that realizes that you can view that either way if you choose to. And the pioneers clearly agreed that the second woe started right where the first woe began. And if you'll turn back to chapter 9 of Revelation, verse 12, this is where the first woe fifth trumpet, ends. It says, One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. I would submit that linguistically, in the English language, you could make a stronger argument that the second and third woe was going to come at some point after the first woe ended than you can make then the third woe come at some point in time after the second woe ended. But the question is, back here, where it says, the second woe is past, behold, the third woe cometh quickly. We all agree that the third woe begins on October 22, 1844. Is there a sense that quickly can mean The here and now, right now, October 22, 1844, comes into history if the second woe ends at the same time. And I, I would like you to turn back um, to Malachi chapter 3, and this is a verse that Sister White places at October 22, 1844, when Christ moved into the most holy place. Malachi chapter 3 says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare, prepare the way before me. Now this next part is what she applies to Christ moving into the most holy place on October 22, 1844. And it says, And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. And I would submit to you that On, there is a sense of suddenness and quickness that has been prophetically associated with October 22, 1844. If we agree, and the pioneers will not disagree with this, and this is a hard one to say in the afternoon, after a week of school, after lunch, but I'll give it a try. If the second trumpet begins where the first trumpet ends and the third trumpet begins where the second trumpet ends and the fourth trumpet begins where the third trumpet begins and the fifth trumpet begins where the fourth trumpet ends and the sixth trumpet begins where the fifth trumpet ends, then it 
probably is reasonable to think that the seventh trumpet begins where the sixth trumpet ends. Now, the problem also that needs to be applied to that is in triple applications of prophecy, which we're going to look in in this, in this study, if the first two times a prophecy is applied in history or fulfilled, if they possess the characteristics of the third application, and if we're saying the three woes are a triple application of prophecy and their classic example thereof, if we expect the third woe here at the end of the world to include the time period when the Millerite movement is repeated and we stop the second woe at 1840, then we're cutting out the Millerite movement and the characteristics of the first and second woe do not include the characteristics that are illustrated by the Millerite movement and therefore we have no justification for placing them in the third woe. So that's, that's some of the reasoning on that, that has been under discussion here. But now, back to our subject at hand, which is not where we were just at. This, as I already said, is unfortunate in a way. After a week of being fed much information that you have not necessarily had enough time to test through the Word of God and through prayer, and coming to the final day, and then just eating lunch, we come to one of the trickiest presentations that there is, and uh, we're going to acknowledge that going in and try to go slow and still get it done on time. These are the characteristics here that we've already been over a couple times. The characteristics of the first woe um, that are identified by the pioneers, I may express them in my words, um, but I can, I can uphold them by the writings of the pioneers. Uh, first woe, Arabic Islam, a power from the bottomless pit. It was sudden and violent in nature. Uh, the first woe uh, possessed a, a long drawn out war between the East and West, Persia and pagan Rome. And that war defeated Persia, but it destroyed all the strength of pagan Rome, um, which allowed Islam to rise into history virtually um, undefended against. That's what gave them the foothold. Uh, Islam in that time period was to torment the beast that was, Eastern Pagan Rome, and the beast that is. It was going to torment them both. They were not to hurt those who had the seal of God. First of all, uh, a command not to hurt those that have the seal of God. And then there's a time prophecy. But they were to hurt and torment for five months, 150 years, um, beginning at the Battle of Nicomedia, July 27, 1299. Uh, this began the Ottoman Empire. And if you, we read it, or at least we brought it on the screen, I passed over quite a bit last night. I'm not sure that I read this, but Uriah Smith makes the case that although Ottoman is the man uh, that begins this 150-year time prophecy, his kingdom is not established until the end, or end of the 150 years when the powers are put in place in Turkey. Um, Okay, they had a king over him who, an angel of bottomless pit, a destroyer, both in the Hebrew and Greek. Um, if you've read Revelation 11 at all this week, and we have, we, saw, we see um, symbolized in Revelation 11 Christ. And how is Christ symbolized in Revelation 11? In a variety of ways. The two witnesses, um, the two prophets, and I would submit to you that you could uh, address this particular part of the first woe in that same fashion. What does Hebrew and Greek tell you? Old and New Testament. Who's the destroyer in the Old and New Testament? Satan. Uh, although the pioneers had a different take on that. Um, we're setting up some symbols here. Um, the first woe concludes when the last emperor of Eastern Rome left his throne to his son, who refused to accept the th throne without permission of the Ottoman, uh, of the Turkish power. And then he ascended the throne when he received their permission, bringing um, the time prophecy to a conclusion. And a few years later, he was, Constantinople was swept away anyway. The second, well, the characteristics. This isn't Arabic Islam. This is Turkish Islam. It's the power from the bottomless pit. It's sudden and violent, but at this point in history, gunpowder is introduced. Here, they're not to torment and kill the beast that was. Torment and hurt the beast that was. They're to kill the beast that was. And the beast that is during this time, Papal Rome, is also slain. And uh, this, 
It begins where the, second woe, where the first woe ends, and it starts the 391, 15-year day time prophecy. It begins when the four angels are loosed. Hence with the identical dynamics of Justinian and the last Constantine. King gives the kingdom away. Shortly thereafter, the kingdom is parceled out. I know that there's even been some different thoughts on the parceling out of Turkey that took place in World War I, um, that it seems a much greater period of time from 1840 till 1918 for the powers of Europe to cut up Turkey into the countries that we now know as Iraq and Iran and those countries over there that used to make up the Ottoman Empire. But that can be addressed simply um, from the point of view that after 1844, um, the, what determines on how quick end time Bible prophecy is going to come to pass is how quick God's people are going to prepare their character because the Lord has been willing to finish his work um, since October 22nd, 1844. He just hasn't found the group of people that want to participate in that yet. Um, the next characteristic of the second woe is it, the situation um, in the battle that came to a conclusion on August 11th, 1840, was that Egypt, a, a nation in the former a woe, an Arabic nation, wanted to conquer Turkey because it realized how weak Turkey was. It wanted to take control of its land. And the Europeans were looking at that, and they thought, the last thing we want to do is to see this Islamic power get reestablished and have to deal with it for several hundred more years and all the nonsense that's been going on with it. So they knew they had Egypt and um, Turkey outgunned, so they decided to intercede and bring uh, the efforts of Egypt to a conclusion. And uh, they did so. And in the midst of that, the, uh, the Pasha of Turkey uh, put his kingdom into the hands of the four European powers. And that's what ended the time prophecy of the 391 years and 15 days. We have discussed uh, more than once in here that uh, the message of the hour is the last six verses of Daniel 11. And of course, this story in the last six verses of Daniel 11 goes right on into the first three verses of Daniel chapter 12 until Daniel is told uh, to seal up his book. Uh, this is the, the conclusion of Daniel. And of course, at this conclusion of Daniel, uh, this is where people get tripped up about um, trying to find some kind of new and interesting prophetic interpretation in the epilogue, if that's the right word, that takes place in, uh, from verse 4 of Daniel 12. The story comes to its conclusion in verse 3 of Daniel 12. Um, and in verse 4 it says, But thou, O Daniel, verse 4 of Daniel 12, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. The book is sealed up. The story is told. Now, there's going to be more information in the rest of the chapter, um, but it's not giving any more information about the sequence of events that begin back in Daniel 11, verse 1. This is a different type of prophetic information that brings, uh, among other things, uh, a logical, a literary, and um, <coughs> theological bridge. It builds a bridge uh, between the books of Daniel and Revelation, because you'll find the time prophecies here in Daniel chapter 12, when they finally come to fulfillment in history, um, it's right in the time period where we see John eating the little book of Daniel. This is the bridge, these last um, nine verses of Daniel 12. But in verse 5, it says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, and the one on this side of the bank of the river and on the other side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the water of the river, <clears throat> how long shall be the end of these wonders? And I'm suggesting to you that this question is for those of us that live at the end of the world. And the wonders that Do Daniel has just uh, recorded are the last six verses of Daniel 11 and the first three verses of Daniel 12 that describe the rise and fall of the king of the north for the last time and identify the events leading up to the second coming of Christ. Those are the wonders. So what I'm suggesting to you, and I'm going to move a little bit now, is that the characteristics of the first four trumpets are set off by themselves and primarily the characteristic of the first four trumpets that we want to deal with uh, is the 
the conclusion. This is where um, Justinian, the emperor of pagan Rome, what did he do in 533? He gave his authority to the papacy and five years later, I better, five years later, his, uh, the kingdom of Bible prophecy, uh, pagan became the kingdom of Bible prophecy that was and the papacy took the throne of the earth. The characteristics in the first woe that we just went over uh, and the characteristics of the second woe, I would suggest are, are repeated in two ways, in two ways at least, more, maybe more than two. Um, one way that I think we need to understand they're repeated is in a triple application of prophecy. The characteristics of the first and second will be reflected in the third. But in another way is by identifying these characteristics and applying them to this last presentation where we set forth what we're calling the prophetic mirror. We see historical events coming to the time period when this third angel's message becomes present truth. The investigative judgment begins. The sounding of the seventh trumpet begins. The third woe begins. Uh, this is the time period all the prophets spoke about. This is the time period that more than anything else is identifying when Christ is going to bring a group of people to perfection in front of all mankind in the worst crisis that there's ever been in order to bring the great controversy to his conclusion. Very important point in biblical history, this time period here. And this time period uh, becomes re reality in the time period of the Sunday Law. And when the Sunday Law arrives in the United States, um, once again, the door closes on the virgins. And as we noted, uh, the, character, the, the symbolic characteristics of these history, remember, prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events. These histories, the, the figurative aspects of these history are reflected in uh, several prophetic events that are very commonly understood to Seventh-day Adventists, only they are reflected in a reverse order. We're suggesting to you that um, the, the experience of the Millerite movement is going to be repeated. It's symbolized both in the parable of the ten virgins and in um, the seven thunders that are sealed up, that we should expect to see one of the things, many things that we should expect to see when it's fulfilled is that uh, in the Millerite time period, when the angel come down out of heaven in Revelation 10 with a little book open in his hand, that he was bringing the little book of Daniel down, and it was um, bringing about the experience of 1840 to 1844. But the historical event, the, the fulfillment of prophecy that was the catalyst um, to marking August 11th, 1840 as the time when Christ came down with the little book open, um, was actually a fulfillment of a prophecy in the book of Revelation. More specifically, it was a fulfillment of a prophecy in the trumpets in the second woe. So it's not just a fulfillment of a prophecy in, in Revelation in general. It's a fulfillment of the prophecy that came from the trumpets. So we're suggesting that when the pioneer experience is repeated, um, there's going to be an angel coming down out of heaven. Is it going to be the angel of Revelation 10? Pardon me? 18. Revelation 18, but it's the same angel. It's Christ. And therefore, we expect that he'll have a little book open in his hand. We know that he will. Sister White's seen that. And uh, what's the little book that's going to be open? The book of Daniel. So we're suggesting that if that much is the same when the angel of Revelation 18 comes down, um, that it is not illogical to expect that just as in the pioneer movement, um, one of the most important truths of that little book, the understanding of that little book, will be to establish a message from the book of Daniel while at the same time connecting it to the book of Revelation, but more specifically, if we really want to get specific to the pioneer movement, then it would be connecting it to a passage in the book of Revelation that had to do with the trumpets. It would be almost identical then, except it would be different prophecies. So what I am suggesting is that when we use the prophetic mirror and we see this reversal, that this history, um, bringing the, the second woe to a conclusion in October 22nd, 1844, that the third woe begins. Let's be clear about this. The third woe begins there. 
and goes onward. But there comes a point in time um, where the, the uh, what, what do we want to call them? The, the woe aspects of the seventh trumpet, and I don't want to make a distinction, the seventh trumpet is the seven woe, but the part that is the intense part when we should expect radical Islam to begin to repeat this, that <clears throat> this time period has been pushed off for a ways due to our disobedience, but still we should expect to see it in the time period when the investigative judgment is still open. And I would submit to you that we need to see it begin before the Sunday law, because, and you'll see why, because radical Islam is uh, the prophetic tool that the Lord uses to bring about the conditions in the United States to bring about the Sunday law and also you know, the next step um, to bring about a one world government. And uh, so let's begin to look at it. That's where we're going. Verse 40 of Daniel 11, I am suggesting, is the first verse, and remember now, Whatever this history is over here that gets reflected out, I'm suggesting um, that it will be in reverse order to this. But what I am suggesting that's a little bit different, this is, this is one I want you to follow on closely, is that when this reverse order begins, that it's going to be represented by Daniel 11, 40 and onward in a sequential order. Now, I'm not saying it's going to go verse 45, verse 44, verse 43. I'm saying it's starting in verse 40. So the first thing we would look at is the characteristics of the second woe. We should expect to see them come into history um, somewhere before the Sunday law. You'll see why. So the characteristics of verse 40. You'll notice uh, my granddaughter Autumn noticed that halfway through this prophecy school when I began using this, she says, you really like to use this, don't you? I've never used one of these before, and these are kind of nice. <laughs> the blue up here is verse 40, and we're suggesting that the green below it is the characteristics of the second woe, and we're going to walk through verse 40. There are two powers from the bottomless pit in verse 40, atheism and Catholicism. Uh, there was two powers... Um, in the second woe, now remember we're dealing with the second woe because it goes backwards. Second woe, first woe, then first four trumpets. And there was two powers from the bottomless pit um, involved in the second woe. The papacy received its deadly wound in that time period in 1798, and of course Islam was there, and it also came from the bottomless pit. In uh, the beginning, the very first passage in Daniel 11, verse 40, the beast that was is slain in 1798. Why do I say that it's the beast that was? Based on Revelation 17 in the 1798 time period, who was the beast that is? In the 1798 time period in Revelation 17, who did we establish was the beast that is? The United States in the 1798 time period, the beast that was, was the papacy. And in the opening movement of verse 40, we see that the beast that was, the papacy, was slain. And we see that the beast that was in the second woe, pagan Rome was slain. Okay, so we're talking about prophetic symbolism here. The beast that was, the beast that is. This is, this is prophetic symbolism. Another characteristic in verse 40 is that the beast that is, the United States, as Protestantism, is also slain. Now, how, why do I say that? Give me a moment, I'll explain myself. But the beast that is in the second woe was papal Rome, and during the time period of the second woe, papal Rome received its deadly wound. Same characteristics in verse 40 that we find in the second woe. Why do I say that the United States was slain? Pagan Rome is a type of the United States, and pagan Rome prophetically falls three times. It ceased to rule the world supremely in the year 330 when the time prophecy of Daniel 11:24, 24, 360 years, came to an end. So it, it prophetically fell then. In 538, Pagan Rome became the beast that was. As a kingdom of Bible prophecy, it fell in that sense for the second time. And then when the last emperor of pagan Rome surrendered um, to the Ottoman Turks, it fell forever from history. So pagan Rome uh, prophetically falls three times. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I won't argue with you that Rome comes into history well before that. And uh, I'm saying prophetically. Um, it ruled the world supremely, that came to an end, it fell as a kingdom of Bible prophecy, and it finally fell as a kingdom, period. 
The United States prophetically falls three times. In verse 40, it changes professions of Protestantism. There's two characteristics to powers in Bible prophecy. There is a spiritual aspect and a political aspect. And as Russell has correctly pointed out in his presentations, the United States fell morally when? At the second angel's message. But the, the fall wasn't complete. It still has to go. It has to go all the way to the Sunday law. But the United States, before the Sunday law, is going to also fall politically. When did it fall politically? In verse 40 of Daniel 11, in the Reagan years, when there was an alliance formed between the Pope and the Vatican, the United States had begun to fulfill its role as the false prophet of Bible prophecy. And in this sense, it was no longer Protestant America. It had become to began to fulfill the role as apostate Protestantism. It falls at that point. And verse 41, at the Sunday Law of the United States, it falls fully and completely when it bows and gives homage to the Roman power. And in verse 42 and 43, it surrenders its sovereignty with the rest of the countries of the world when it forces the world to set up a, ch a combination of church and state um, with the papacy in control. So you can show three places um, where the United States falls, just like pagan Rome. And in that sense, um, in verse 40, the beast that was was slain, and the beast that is was also slain. The collapse of a great empire. In verse 40, we see a collapse of a great empire, the USSR. In the second woe, we see a collapse of a great empire, the Ottoman Empire. <clears throat> uh, when, the, when the fall of the U Soviet Union took place, uh, you can get lots of documentation on this. Before it happened, Gorbachev went and surrendered his kingdom to the Pope of Rome. Shortly thereafter, the Soviet Union come tumbling down. That's exactly where the second woe ends when uh, the Ottoman Turks turned their kingdom over to the four powers of Europe, and shortly thereafter, their kingdom was cut up. Um, in verse 40, we have a three-way war between atheism, the king of the south, the papacy, the king of the north, and the United States symbolized as chariots, ships, and horsemen. And in the second woe, we have a three-way war between Egypt, Turkey, and the four great powers of Europe. Um, the, the history of verse 40 was fulfilled in the history of Laodicea. Uh, the history of the second woe was fulfilled in Philadelphia. I'm suggest suggesting to you that um, Daniel 11:40 parallels um, the second woe, and it tells us that the intensity that we usually think of when we think of the woes is underway because these events make up the third woe. What I'm saying is the third woe has begun. Verse 41. We'll go through the same step-by-step -step process. In verse 41, we have a power from the bottomless pit, the king of the north, the papacy. But now we're dealing with the first woe, the fifth trumpet. And in the first woe, we have Islam, a power from the bottomless pit. Um, the verse 41 is preceded by a war between the south and the north. And this is the key, this is the key the pioneers pointed to uh, in the first woe, the fifth trumpet, uh, that brought Islam to arise. This long, drawn-out war uh, between the king of the south and the king of the north in verse 40 is what preceded verse 41, and the long drawn out war between pagan Rome and Persia um, was part of the story of the first woe that preceded um, the rise of Islam into history. It's one of the histories the pioneers identify. The war was the key. The war was the key. The beast that was is tormented. Um, we're suggesting that the beast that was in the first woe uh, was not to be killed. He was going to be killed in the second wall. Here he was to be tormented and hurt, and we're suggesting that in verse 41, um, in the, the, the verse where the Sunday law comes, that the beast that was um, the United States, which fell as Protestant America in the previous verse, is to be tormented um, in the first woe. The beast that was pagan Rome was tormented. It ends with the king surrendering. Um, when the United States clasps hands with the Roman power, national apostasy will be followed by national ruin. Um, the first woe ends with the king surrendering the Roman Empire to the Ottoman Turks, and shortly thereafter, Constantinople was taken over by the Turks. 
In the first woe, we have a pronouncement to, not, to hurt not those who are sealed. In verse 41, we have the Sunday law in the United States where God's people are sealed. I don't think that's an accident. I think that's what one of the, the symbolic things that this history is pointing forward to. It's linked to the next verse by the image of the beast. What do I mean? <clears throat> I mean this, that in the, first, in the first part of the first woe, in the beginning of the first woe, uh, the pi we read this, I made sure we read this, um, I believe, uh, the, the Islam's attack on Eastern Rome was random and, and all over the place. But there came a man into history, um, Ottman, that rallied the troops. And uh, the whole part I think I remember reading was it pointed out that he brought um, Islam under, under civil government. And uh, this went for the 150 years, and that's what gave them the, the cohesiveness was this ruler um, that brought them together under church and state. So in the first woe, um, you can see symbolized the combination of church and state that took place as part of that history. And, of course, the, the link from verse 40 and 41 is the fact that combination of church and state began in the Ronald Reagan years with the alliance between the United States and the Vatican. Triple applications. We went over this a lot. Let's remind ourselves uh, three Elijah's first two fulfillment possesses the characteristics of the third. Uh, three abominations of de desolation. First two fulfillments possess the character of the third. Three Rome's first two fulfillments. Pagan Rome, Papal Rome possess the characteristics of the third. Three woes. First two fulfillments possess the characteristics of the third. Upon the testimony of two or three, a thing shall be established. First two woes. And, and, and I'm saying first two woes in the sense that we're looking now at how these two woes together should reflect the characteristics of the third woe overall. It should be Islam. We should accept, expect to see Islam come into history. They should be, uh, their, their modus operandi should be that they would be sudden, violent, with an emphasis on gunpowder. Read the front pages lately. Uh, power was in their tails. And in Isaiah 19, in 915, it says, The ancient and the honorable, he is the head, and the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. Um, the, this, you, if you wish, you can apply it to Muhammad. I think it fits. But I also think you can apply it to the, the uh, imams over in Iraq or someone that, like the, the guy that just died. What's Arafat? Uh, the power, their, their leaders, their, their heads, that's where the power was. Um, and uh, their power was in their mouth, it says, one of the characters of Islam. And in Exodus 4.16, it says, He shall be thy spokesman unto thy people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, thou, and thou shall be to him instead of God. And it's talking about the relationship of Aaron and Moses, and Aaron was to be the mouth for um, Moses, and uh, the mouth is one of the characteristics um, where the power is located in Islam. In other words, they're spokespeople. Um, once again, somebody like an Arafat or the, the Sadr that's in Iraq or uh, the guy they're hunting for, Ben Laden. Um, he torments, they'll torment, torment the beast that was, kill the beast that was, and the beast that is. It brings down Rome. What I'm saying is Islam is going to torment both the beast that was, the beast that is, and it will bring down Rome. Now back here, where it brought down the final, the first four trumpets brought down Western Rome, the next two trumpets brought down Eastern Rome, but in this time period, the papacy was brought down as well. And pagan Rome and papal Rome are two witnesses that tell us about modern Rome. And modern Rome uh, we know is made up of three parts, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. And Islam is the power that will bring down, uh, or kill, bring down, be the catalyst that brings down um, the new world order of the beast, dragon, and false prophet, the holy trinity, based upon the characteristics of the first two woes. The first two illustrate the characteristics of the three. Uh, Ishmael's prophecy, which has to be incorporated 
into any study of the woes in Islam. Every man's hand will be against him. His hand will be against every man. He will be a wild man. It's this characteristic that makes him the catalyst to not only bring about the Sunday law in the United States, but bring the new world order together into a one world government and bring the world to its knees. Because remember, after the Sunday law in the United States, what happens? Um, the destroyer, both in the Hebrew and the Latin, appears and begins to personate Christ during this time period um, at the Sunday law in the United States. And during this time period, he begins to fulfill his role as a Barabbas, when the whole world is choosing between Christ and the false Christ. Barabbas meaning son of Abbas. And at the same time period, national apostasy is followed by national ruin. I personally do not believe, I don't think you can uphold, that the judgments of God that are, that are brought about by the national apostasy are strictly Islam. I think those are additional judgments. The world is being brought to its knees um, right here. Now, I personally believe, and, uh, and I'm, I'm taking this from history, I do not believe Islam is a godly power. I think it's a satanic power. It comes from the bottomless pit. But in history, the Lord has used Islam providentially in his own way, and history identifies that Islam um, has been used to provide protection um, in, a, in a few striking ways. It was, uh, history records that it was the Islam countries that preserved the received text of the Bible. So they, there, you can point to them as the one that preserved the word of God at a time period just prior to the battle over the false translations and the true translations and the power that preser preserved the true translations was Islam. You can go into the history of the Protestant Reformation and you can show that many, many, not just occasionally, many of the times when Rome, Papal Rome was going to send armies to attempt to snuff out the Protestant reformers, that Islam would come, come down out of the north or east or wh where it was coming from, and the armies of Rome would be forced to go and deal with Islam, providing a chance for the Protestant Reformation to get off the, the ground. Um, Islam, when it spread out geographically, it wrapped up Europe, uh, preventing Catholicism, spreading the Dark Ages all around the world, instead of just simply primarily in Europe. Um, and as Jack points out, I won't throw this one in, although I do like it. But I, I, got enough, I got enough arguments to deal with as this tape goes out. But I, I think it's valid, but I need to read it a couple of times. So Islam has been used providentially. I don't know how. I, I, I don't have any idea how. But for me, when I see the catastrophic things that are going to take place at the end of the time, at the end of time and I do expect uh, them to be taking place in the sealing time of the Sunday law time period, it's easy for me to see if the armies of uh, the United States are chasing Islam around the world, uh, providing God's people opportunity to go hither and yon and carry the final warning message that this would qualify as the same type of protection, protection that they provided in the Protestant Reformation. But I want to note here, they are a power from the bottomless pit, but they are also primarily a tool in the hand of the Lord's providence. So, when it comes to looking at this history, I hope you're seeing that the reverse, the reverse of these three sections of the trumpets, if you reverse it out, that the characteristics parallel with the last six verses of Daniel 11 and even on into Revelation 12, 3. And um, we should expect to see the, the rise of Islam here in verse 41 is illustrated here in the first woe, the fifth trumpet. And what brought Islam into, his, into power, into, to rise into power, was a long drawn out war between east and west. When we reflect this over here and we look at verse 41, we see that verse 41 follows a long drawn out war, not between east and west, but between who? The king of the south and the king of the north began in 1798 went till 1989. Therefore, after 1989, after the fulfillment of verse 40, I would submit to you that we should expect to see Islam strike, begin to fulfill its role as the catalyst of Bible prophecy that brings about these events. And I would suggest to you that on September 11th, um, the two horns, the two prophetic horns of the United States in Bible prophecy at the end of the world, military and economic strength. Remember, 
By the time Ronald Reagan, in verse 40, formed a secret alliance with the Vatican in the 1980 time period, uh, we had sold out not only our moral authority in the 1842 fall of Babylon time period, but our political authority had been surrendered to the papacy. And our, our two horns of strength at this point are military and economic. And brothers and sisters, that's what was hit on 9-11. And uh, the crisis that brings about the Sunday law environment is the crisis of the third woe. Islam is the third woe. Now, the first four trumpets end in 533, when Justinian surrenders his kingdom. Five years later, his a kingdom swept away. Uh, fifth trumpet ends, same dynamics, same dynamics, we've, re we've named the names. Sixth trumpet ends, and, and, I, uh, and I'm causing a stumbling block here, I should say the 391 years, 15 days ends in 840. I need to fix that, but you know what I mean. I'm talking about the, the dynamics of uh, the, the king giving away his kingdom. Shortly thereafter, the kingdom swept away. So uh, what are the histories of 533, 1449, 1840. What are they telling us? In verse 40, we see a king giving away his kingdom, in paralleling this history. It's Gorbachev. He goes to visit the Pope, um, paralleling this. In verse 41, who's giving their kingdom away? The United States of America is giving its kingdom away, paralleling this. Shortly thereafter, national apostasy is followed by national ruin. Notice that in verse 42 and 43, down here, we are saying this parallels the first four trumpets. In verse 42 and 43, we see the ten kings of Revelation 17 giving their kingdom unto the beast. And uh, in order for that to take place, we've already went through over this earlier, the same dynamics are going to take place that took place in the year 533. Because in 533, Justinian, the emperor of civil Rome, the civil power of the kingdom, um, which parallels the United Nations down here, Egypt of Daniel 11, 42 and 43, the 10 kings of Revelation 17. Those 10 kings agreed to give their kingdom unto the beast. And in this time period, there is going to be a religious crisis of Islam. In 533, there was a religious crisis, only it was um, over who was the greatest church, the church in Rome or Constantinople. And it was over the Trinity doctrine, but it was a religious crisis. And just, Justinian at that time interceded into that religious crisis, and he made the Pope of Rome the head of the churches and the corrector of heretics. And these first four trumpets, that's where they come to a conclusion. And I'm suggesting that these four trumpets, as they reflect out, are paralleled here in verses 42 and 43, when the ten kings agree to give their kingdom unto the beast for a short period of time at the end of the world for the purpose of being the head of the churches and the corrector of heretics. And when they do that, shortly thereafter, their kingdom is swept away as it all comes tumbling down when Michael stands up and all the events of Daniel 12, 1 through 3 are repeated. What of the night? Do I discern the import of these messages? Do I understand the place they occupy in the closing work of the great remedial system? Am I so familiar with the sure word of prophecy that I can see the events transpiring around me, see in the events transpiring around me positive evidence that the coming king is even at the door? Do I sense the responsibility that rests upon me in view of the light God has given? Am I using every talent entrusted to me as his steward in well-directed well -directed effort to rescue the perishing? Or am I lukewarm and indifferent, partly mixed up with a wicked world, using the means and ability God has given me, largely in self-gratification, caring more for my own ease and comfort than for the advancement of his cause? Am I, by, am I by my own course strengthening the conviction that has been gaining ground in the world that Seventh-day Adventists are giving the trumpet an uncertain sound? and are following in the path of worldlings. <clears throat> Any questions? In the role that uh, the long drawn out war that you described 
Can you just quickly describe the two long drawn out wars one more time? <clears throat> well, l let me say now, I, I, I gave the characteristics of the trumpets going down and then reversing out, and then I took a look at the same history um, from the point of view of a triple application of prophecy, which all it does is add another layer of truth, okay? In the two long drawn out wars, um, the one that the pioneers in history attest to that provided the vacuum of the strength in the Roman Empire was the long drawn out war between Persia and Rome. And Rome won that war, uh, but immediately after that war, pagan Rome did not have the strength to resist the rise of Islam. I'm saying that this history um, parallels this history in the sense that this is the history, uh, verse 41, Daniel 11, in that time period, just in the time period leading up to, I would say, the, this verse 41, because uh, verse 40 came to an end in 1989, and there's a time period between 1989 and the Sunday Law. But after 1989, the, the long drawn out war is the war between the king of the south and the king of the north. And I heard someone say earlier in a discussion about this, and I think I was a listener, not a speaker, well, in the, the war between Eastern Rome and Persia, um, these powers were just sapped of their strength, but in reality, um, in the war between the king of the south and the king of the north, the, the king of the north didn't get sapped of its strength. I don't remember what the argument was, but uh, you don't have to see all the characteristics. You just need to identify the way marks. In the long run, in our scenario here, with the uh, king of the north being the papacy, and the king of the south being the Soviet Union, <clears throat> I wasn't thinking of that aspect at all, but in reality what took place was that the military might of the Soviet Union was also sapped by a long Cold War with the West. That's right. But the ultimate goal of the papacy, to put itself back on the throne of the, of the world, it began its conquests in Western Europe in the year 538, right? The papacy began its conquest of the world in 538 in Western right, it, Europe. Uh, it, what do you mean by that? In 538, it has been established in power. Right, but as it, as, it, as it was established in power, it swept through Europe and it, it gave the rights of kings to all the kings, England, France, all the well-known Western powers. Okay, consolidated its power that was exactly. established in 538. Okay. Now, <clears throat> as it begins to, in the 20th century, come up to its time where, it, you know, it, it, she says in the Great Controversy, it's biding its time. And it's working behind the scenes. Waiting for vantage Wait, ground. Waiting for vantage ground. Now, I, I want to ask a question. Did Ronald Reagan have the brains to think of this himself? I don't think so. And did he have advisors that was advising him to meet with, with the papacy? And what was that? It must, they must have retracted it. I don't know. But anyway, so what I'm thinking is, is that prior to the meeting with Reagan and the Pope. Gorbachev. Uh, Gorbachev. Or, well, well, Reagan and the Pope. Reagan and the Pope. 1982. Okay, 1982. Would it be a far stretch to suggest that the, the papacy was behind this meeting? That's and a, that, not in my and, mind. And it had been working so through the long years of the Cold War. Because it's oh, waited, no, 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 for, no, no. It, it, it waited oh. for its opportunity and its, its mission was to reset itself on the throne of the world, and it had to use the United States to do so. Okay, I, I want to I tell you, I, I'm not trying to sell you anything, particularly because it's the Sabbath and I don't want to sell you <laughs> anything anyway, but we had books out there until yesterday that we packed up, and one of them was called Rome Stoops to Conquer. And that was written when? 1935. 19 1935. I didn't it, buy that book because I have one at home. Okay. It tells that Rome was doing just that. It gives the documentation, except it, it gives the projections of what they want to do. And we look lot around in the world today and say, they're done, did. And so my question to you is that Reagan was approached by Rome. Undoubtedly, Rome was the instigator in the secret negotiations. Uh, yeah. If you listen to the Larry King interview, you'll see that his advisors were Catholics. The head of the CIA was a Catholic, a, a militant Catholic. This would lend credence to your uh, Bible prophecy that she entered into the glorious land. Yes. 
because Talk. she's the one that's entering in, she's the one that's instigating it, and she's the one that's carrying out her plans. Yes, I agree. Okay. But that wasn't more really a question, it seemed more like a comment, well, which is okay. <laughs> yes. That's how I understand it as well. A another question? We have 10 minutes. Eight, Eight minutes. Okay, no question, let me summarize. What I'm suggesting in closing <clears throat> is that when the trumpets of Revelation 8 and 9 are broken up into three blocks, the first block is the four trumpets, the first woe is a block, the second woe is a block, and they approach, when, when they meet October 22nd, 1844, they meet the mirror time. You got a better way to express it. I don't mind using it. Just tell me what it is. This is where uh, this history back here gets reflected out. I'm saying reflected because in a mirror you see reverse order going back into history. We, we can demonstrate the events that, that we understand take place at the end of the world are when the Sunday Law once again makes the third angel's message present truth where it started, where the mirror started, when it comes to an end, right where it started, then these events have been symbolized only in reverse order. We know that this time period that I'm calling the mirror is the time period of the sounding of the seventh uh, trumpet where the mystery of God is completed, that all the prophets spoke about, and that is uh, the mystery of Christ in us, the hope of glory, that is um, finished in the history of the world uh, during the investigative judgment when the Lord brings about um, his character in a group of people that we call 144,000. So, because we have a history here that comes to this sounding of the seventh angel, and then at some point in time, some point in time, it begins to reflect backwards. I'm saying that this history of the trumpets comes to the identical history, and that at some point in time, we should expect to see uh, these blocks reflected out in reverse order, which we can do. And when we place the prophetic characteristics from a variety of ways on these three blocks and then place them over here in history, we can show that these characteristics exist in the very message that we've been trying to identify all week long, Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And with that, what, what this adds to the story of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, is that somewhere after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we should expect to see in history the power that is the catalyst to bring every man's hand together because the catalyst is a wild and crazy man that's hand is against every man. And sure enough, since 1989, and, I, and we've talked about when we can track um, the, the terrorist actions of the Islamic world, it, it goes back before 1989, but somewhere after 90, 1989, just as in the history of these woes, we should expect to see um, the armies of Islam attack the armies of Rome. And in, 19, in, in, in verse 40 of Daniel 11, the United States became the armies of Rome. So after 1989, we should expect to see radical Islam at some point in time attack the United States of America, thus bringing about the catalyst that brings us to verse 41 and the sealing of God's people at the Sunday Law in the United States. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your prophetic word and uh, we thank you for being here with us throughout this week, and I once again lift up uh, this group here and anyone that may um, participate in this study through the tapes that we're uh, producing here. I, I ask that you would bring conviction upon the hearts to test these things, evaluate these things, and uh, if they're true, to make them their own, make them part of their experience. But um, beyond that, Lord, I'd ask that you'd use this information this week to speak to each of our hearts about the nearness of your return and our need of personal preparation for the time of trouble which is about to come upon us. 
as a thief in the night. Lord, we want to be ready. We need to be changed. We know that change can only come by the infilling of your Holy Spirit on a moment-by-moment, um, in a moment-by-moment way. We ask for um, the willingness individually to participate um, in that uh, incarnation between ourselves and the Holy Spirit. Do what it takes in each of our individual lives to make that real here and now. And give us the courage to see that you're fully willing to finish the work which you began in each of us. In Jesus' name, amen.